Hi, I'm David Taub, and welcome to the Parsha Rabbit Hole, where I find something weird in the weekly Torah portion and follow it all the way down until it gets even weirder. This week's rabbit hole eventually gets us to Math and Enrico Fermi. You ever think of that, Enrico Fermi? But, as always, we have to get there. This week's Torah portion, Parshas Bechu Koisai, tells us all the good things that God will bless us with if we follow the laws of the Torah, and then conversely, all the bad things that'll happen if we don't follow the laws of the Torah. And one of the blessings is that when the Jews fight wars with their enemies, it says, five of you will chase 100 of them, and 100 of you will chase 10,000 of them. Okay, so you might be kind of surprised that this is the thing that I decided to dig into. War really isn't my thing. But the math in that verse was interesting to me. The first thing it says is that five Jews will chase 100 enemies. So if you simplify that, you get a ratio of 1 to 20. But the second part says 100 Jews will chase 10,000 enemies, which is a ratio of 1 to 100. So that's a different ratio. In the beginning of the verse, it's 1 to 20, and then the second part, it's 1 to 100. So it seemed to me that if I started digging into that, I might find some fun math stuff. Where am I? Mathematic land. We've covered a lot of different types of topics here in the rabbit hole. Strange creatures, ancient technology, music, colors, but we haven't really done a math rabbit hole yet. Welcome to Math Rabbit's Spectacular Circus of Numbers! And even though I'm probably just as bad at math as I would be at being a soldier, I thought it'd be fun. So that's where this week's rabbit hole starts, with some weird ratios and a blessing. So if you're ready to see where that takes us, let's dive in. So obviously one of the first places I looked was Rashi, who solves this problem by kind of bypassing the math altogether. First he points out the problem, that the ratios don't match up. He says that based on the first ratio of 1 to 20, then the second part where it talks about 100 Jews should say that they could chase away only 2,000 enemies. That would keep the ratio 1 to 20. But it doesn't say that. It says 10,000, which is five times more than what you would expect it to be. And he answers, based on Midrash, that you can't compare a small number of people who are fulfilling Torah to a large number of people who are fulfilling Torah. In other words, the more people you have coming together and being involved in Torah and mitzvahs, what they can accomplish increases more than just the sum of what that number of individuals can accomplish. So strength in numbers. He doesn't give us an algorithm to figure out what that increase would be and how to apply it to different numbers. It's just a general rule. So this answer doesn't really give us any fun math stuff. Math rabbit, that's for all times. Eggheads. But it does take it away from being purely about military strength and makes it be more about being involved in Torah and mitzvahs in general, kind of tying it back to the general theme of all these blessings. Which I like because it gives us a way to think about the fun math stuff that we are going to find later on in other commentaries in a broader context that's not just about war, but about the power of people doing good things. But there is one technical question on this Rashi before we move on. I was talking to a friend about this, and I mentioned that Rashi is talking about some sort of spiritual power of Jews gathering together to do mitzvahs. And my friend said, well, not necessarily, it's just strength in numbers. That's a natural phenomenon that applies to everything, not just Torah. If we work together as a team, the fearsome five shall fall! So I dug around a little bit and found that the commentaries on Rashi actually address this. They mention a Gemara as a support for this idea that says that the load that a person can put on their own shoulders is one third of what a person can carry if they have people helping them load it onto their shoulders. So based on that, we could say that this is a natural thing. The more people you have working together, the more they can accomplish, even more than the combined force of each individual. But there's a problem with that. It seems like Mizrahi is the one who makes this point first, but his discussion of it is kind of mixed together with other ideas and it gets a little bit confusing. So I'm going to quote from the Maharal, who presents it in a way that's clearer to me. He says that if we're just talking about the natural phenomenon of strength in numbers, then both sides cancel each other out. Whatever extra strength the group of Jews has by working together, the group of enemies also has the same additional strength. But if we work together, we can make the world safe for war profits. Which means that Rashi's answer has to be about a spiritual phenomenon of Jews working together to fulfill a mitzvah that isn't matched by the physical strength in numbers of the other side. This also explains why Rashi switches over to talking about fulfilling mitzvahs instead of sticking with talking about war. So that's the way of solving this ratio problem without any fancy math. 
but the Balitosis take a little bit more of a mathy approach to the problem. They say that when the verse says five of you will chase 100 and 100 of you will chase 10,000, the second part is a continuation of the first part, meaning five of you will chase 100 and then 100 of those groups of five will chase 10,000, meaning 500 Jews will chase away 10,000 enemies. Which gets us back to the original ratio. Five to 100 is the same ratio as 500 to 10,000. They're both one to 20. I like those odds. But Ibn Ezra takes a different approach. And honestly, I'm not entirely sure what that approach is. I dug around looking for explanations of what Ibn Ezra is saying, and everybody seems to explain it basically the same way, but that way doesn't make any sense to me. So I'm going to present it to you in that way first, the way that doesn't make any sense to me. And then I'm going to tell you my problems with that and what I think makes more sense. So here it goes. He starts out by explaining the idea of ones, tens, thousands, etc and that each of those is how you round up from the level below. If you have one, you round up to 10. If you're in the tens, you round up to 100. And then he says when people are magnifying a number for the sake of comparison, we'll go up by one order of magnitude, one against 10. But the Torah doubles this and says five against 100. So what does that mean that the Torah doubles the normal way of comparing numbers? Right, let's do the math. The way everyone explains it is that the normal way would be to multiply by 10, which would get you 50. But here, the Torah doubles that to show how extra powerful the Jews will be, so twice as much as 50 is 100. So that gets you the ratio in the beginning of the verse, 5 to 100. Then Ibn Ezra continues and explains the second part of the verse, 100 to 10,000. He says each of the 100 will then chase away 100, and 100 times 100 is 10,000. And everybody explains that as meaning that each of the Jews will chase away 100 enemies. Then Ibn Ezra finishes by saying that some people solved the problem by saying that the strength of each individual is increased when they join together as a group, which sounds like Rashi to me. And then he ends by saying that's not necessary, you don't need to do that. But the way I just explained that Ibn Ezra to you makes no sense to me. That's very hard for me to understand. First of all, the whole thing about rounding at the beginning doesn't connect with anything. If we're just multiplying by 10, why talk about how each level gets rounded up to the next? But more importantly, it doesn't solve the ratio problem at all. He says a normal way to make the statement that one group is stronger than the other would be to multiply by 10, and Torah goes double and multiplies by 10 and then two, giving us one to 20, but then why does the next part of the verse change to one to 100? It's the same original question, we haven't answered it. So then when he dismisses the strength in numbers argument as unnecessary, why? He hasn't answered the question yet. It just doesn't make sense. And I like for things to make sense, that's all. But I think there's a different way to read this Ibn Ezra that does make sense. When Ibn Ezra says that the normal way of magnifying or exaggerating a number is to go from 1 to 10, I don't think he means multiplying by 10. I think he means rounding up to the next order of magnitude, which would make complete sense with his thing at the beginning about 1's rounding up to 10 and 10's rounding up to 100. And since 5 is technically in the 1's, it could get rounded up to 10. But since the Torah is trying to show us that the Jews will be very strong compared to their enemies, it goes up two orders of magnitude instead of one. So instead of rounding 5 to 10, it gets bumped up to 100. So then the second part of the verse makes sense too. 100 goes up two orders of magnitude to 10,000. And that solves the ratio problem by saying it's not an exact ratio. 5 to 100 isn't a ratio of 1 to 20, it's an imprecise ratio of 1 to 100, two orders of magnitude more. And then when Ibn Ezra says that the strength in numbers explanation isn't necessary, that makes sense because according to him, the ratio doesn't change. 5 to 100 and 100 to 10,000 are both generally 1 to 100. So over Shabbos, I showed this to a friend of mine who's much smarter than me to see if the way I was reading it made any sense. And he said, oh yeah, it's a Fermi problem. And I didn't know what that was. So he explained to me that it's a way of estimating complicated calculations when you don't have a lot of actual data. And it's named after physicist Enrico Fermi because he was known for being particularly good at it. The most famous example is from when he was working on the Manhattan Project, developing the atomic bomb. Hope he's taken a very modest three kilotons, tell us in with 45, 20,000 20, tons of DNT, and does anyone want the side action on atmospheric ignition? <laughs>
During the Trinity test, which was the first test detonation of a nuclear weapon, he estimated the strength of the blast by tearing up little scraps of paper and then dropping them and observing that instead of floating straight down, they were pushed about two and a half yards away by the shockwave. And based on that, he estimated that the blast had a force equal to 10 kilotons of TNT. So how close was he? The currently accepted number is 21 kilotons of TNT. That bomb has more power than 20,000 tons of TNT. So depending on what you're using that estimate for, it can either seem way off or surprisingly accurate. Fermi problems are also sometimes called order of magnitude problems. You're not trying to get the exact answer, you're just trying to get in the ballpark within one order of magnitude of the actual answer. It's a back of the envelope estimate that's just trying to get a feel for what range you're dealing with. So after Shabbos, I looked it up and learned all about it, and I realized that this actually comes up all the time. I actually saw an interesting Reddit thread when I was working on the Alioa Navi rabbit hole a couple of weeks ago, where someone was trying to figure out how much Alioa Navi Elijah the prophet would have to weigh in order to not get alcohol poisoning from sipping wine at each Seder. There are a lot of assumptions and estimations made at every step, which is part of the fun of this type of problem. Very often, the assumptions and errors at each step end up canceling each other out, ending up with an answer that's not too far off. In the case of that Reddit thread, there's really no way to know if that person's estimate of 1 million pounds is within an order of magnitude of Elio and Navi's actual weight. So looking at Ibn Ezra's approach to this verse as a Fermi problem makes a lot of sense to me. But I mentioned this to my math genius brother-in-law, and he added another layer. He said that he thinks Ibn Ezra is saying that the 100 to 10,000 in the second part of the verse is actually talking about 100 enemies, the 100 enemies that were driven off by the five Jews in the first part of the verse. So the first 100 get scared off and go tell the rest of their army to run. So after my brother-in-law told me that, I went and I looked back at Ibn Ezra and saw that this actually fits a lot better with his wording, because he says, each one of the 100 chases 100. And the only 100 that we were talking about was the 100 enemies. So according to this reading of Ibn Ezra, the verse isn't two different calculations, it's one long calculation. Well, according to my calculations, five Jews chase about 100, and then each of those 100 enemies chase off 100 of their fellow soldiers, giving a final count of 10,000, which would mean that five Jews could beat an army of 10,000 enemies. My brother-in-law also pointed out that this actually makes it more of a Fermi problem, where the assumptions and approximations made at each step get applied forward. By the way, I just want to note that even though I tried to steer away from the military aspect of this verse and focus on the fun math stuff, War still had a way of creeping its way back in. Good God, y'all! But the math was fun. And I like the idea of the verse being two steps in one process. That feels more interesting to me than making it just be two arbitrary examples. But as I was doing my final sweep for stuff about this, I found an explanation from Svas Emis that actually makes Rashi's non-mathy spiritual answer also be about steps in a process. He says that based on Rashi's explanation that 100 Jews doing mitzvahs together are more powerful than each of those individuals alone, or smaller groups alone, then why not just start with more people? Why even bother with a group of 5 defeating 100, just get 100 people together and go straight to defeating 10,000? And he says that it's a process. You have to start with 5 people defeating 100, and then once that's been accomplished, only then will larger groups of tzaddikim be able to gather. And then he concludes that all of the blessings in this Parsha are steps in a process leading to the improvement of the entire Jewish people as a whole. So what I liked about this was, first of all, it turns one little verse full of numbers into a whole story. You start by scrounging together five good people to do something good together, and then the good that they do has an effect on the world, and it enables more good people to be able to band together to do even more good until eventually everybody is doing good things. It may be a bumpy flight, but working together, mankind will take a giant leap closer to the things you're describing. But what I like most is that it changes the way I look at these blessings and punishments. The normal way I would look at it is all or nothing. If you're good, then all this good stuff will happen. And if you're bad, then all this bad stuff will happen. So I like the idea of looking at it as a process of being good. Start with being a little bit good, or just some people being good, and then eventually everybody will be awesome. I like that. All right, that's it, that's the rabbit hole. As always, if you have any questions or want to show me something cool I missed, put it in the comments. Thank you for following me down the rabbit hole for the 33rd time, or the 660th time, or maybe it's the 3,300th time?